get settled, and we'll get started here in a few minutes. your heart, it stirs your soul, what matters comes in mind, the cares you keep, the thoughts you think, it's not all wasted time. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started tonight. <coughs> Got a uh, couple announcements as we get rolling this evening. Easter is coming up soon, March 31st. So we'd encourage you guys to be praying about Easter, thinking about that. Um, I'm encouraging folks to think about and pray about who you may want to invite to church on Easter. Um, somebody maybe who has been here before, but you haven't seen them in a while, um, or whatever the case may be, Easter is a wonderful time to do that. And uh, the Easter day is good, and it will be a straightforward um, presentation and understanding of Christ, the cross, and the gospel, so it'll be a good day for that. Um, we're also going to do some other things on Easter Sunday. Um, we're going to do our Easter egg hunt for the kids right after service. So... If you would like to volunteer bags of candy for that, you can bring in those bags of candy and then we'll get those Easter eggs stuffed. Bring them in Sunday. Technically next Tuesday by six o'clock um, is kind of the deadline for those candy donations because um, the youth are gonna um, stuff the eggs next week on Tuesday night so we can get ready for that. So bring those, <clears throat> bring that stuff coming up uh, for Easter on the 31st. And then um, I want to let you guys know about something that um, just kind of developed today, but I wanted um, our congregation to be involved with. I received a call from a friend here in town, a friend I've had for a long time who's also a pastor here. Um, he got connected to a group of people who are uh, circulating a petition 
to get an initiative on the ballots for this year here in the state of Colorado, and it is a pro-life initiative. Um, it would be a pro-life thing to vote for on the Colorado state ballot. Now, in the state of Colorado, this is you know a long shot, but I think it's important for us to be able to do these kinds of things. So this, right now, it's called Initiative 81. <clears throat> We've got copies of this for you all so that you, you can actually read this. It's just over a page and a half long, so it's not that complicated. It is a full-blown pro-life anti-abortion amendment to the state of Colorado. It would literally um, extend all protection of life um, to a child at the moment of conception. So it would effectively completely ban abortion as well as uh, the mailing of abortion pills into the state of Colorado. It would all make that illegal here in the state of Colorado. So as I was talking to him and reading up on it, I thought, you know what, I'm absolutely happy to facilitate this. Um, so he and some of his family members are going to be here in the foyer um, at the end of service. Um, you guys have a chance to read this. They've got more information if you want to ask them more questions about this particular initiative and petition. And um, if you are so inclined, they are also looking for people uh, to run around with clipboards and get more signatures. So if that is you, if that is your personality, um, then you may wanna ask them about that as well. But this Initiative 81, a couple of the significant portions that come out of this, on the uh, first page here, under Declaration of the People, number three, I just want to read a couple of pieces of this. Uh, the website where this information is, is gotaheart.org, is the name of the website. But under number three here, uh, what this would do, what this is promoting is this, it is unethical to intentionally kill innocent human beings. Children are fully human, alive and growing from day one when two gametes combine to form the unique DNA of a new living human being at conception. So this is some of the biblical and scientific view behind this. Number four, it is not necessary to intentionally cause the death of a child. Medical personnel shall not purposefully destroy lives. Living children must not be dismembered, scalded, poisoned, or caused fatal harm through inhumane treatment. So you get a feel for a little bit of this. On the back page here, <clears throat> Under equal protection of every living child, uh, lawful protection, so this kind of thing is kind of right at the core of this petition. A living human child must not be intentionally dismembered, mutilated, poisoned, scalded, starved, stabbed, given toxic injections known to cause death, left to die of the elements for lack of warmth or nutrition, used for experimentation or treated in any way inhumanely to cause intentional physical harm leading to intended death, or intended to cause disability to otherwise healthy and functioning parts of the body of a child. So, <clears throat> and this is what's um, it's gonna be out there in the foyer afterward. Um, I plan on signing this petition. I literally just now learned of this. The deadline for these petitions is March 28, so it all has to happen, you know, like this. So, um, if you are so inclined, you are more than happy um, to ask some questions and <clears throat> sign the petition and ask Chris Giona what it was like to, uh, to drum with the best drummer he knew in high school. I'm, I'm kidding. I've known Chris Giona since high school. Um, he's the best drummer I know, and he's a wonderful guy and a good pastor. So he was actually the best man at my wedding. Yeah, yeah, so I owe him one. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. As we get started tonight, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful again for this time together tonight. We're thankful for the things that we've been able to celebrate and do over the last couple of weeks. And this evening, Father, as we gather again, um, our kids, our students, ourselves in this room, we pray your grace upon this time. We ask all of it would glorify you. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would encourage our relationships with you as well tonight. Your truth, your goodness, your word, and your will at work within us. We pray these things in your magnificent name. Amen. <clears throat> 
All right, so just so you know, Meg, this is not on the confidence monitor. I don't, you probably know that already, but there we go. All right, so, spe- so this, this is a classic reference here, by the way, just, just so that you guys know, this, this is good stuff. Um, speaking of laws in the state of Colorado, it is very difficult to keep up with um, the stuff that just keeps popping up. I ran across a headline regarding this particular, um, this particular proposed law a little while ago, um, and then Eric Lynn sent me an article that the National Review wrote about this um, law, this proposed law. It hasn't even made its way out of committee, but uh, it's deemed to be so intrusive and so bad that the National Review wrote an entire article about how bad this particular bill is. The state of Colorado is considering European-style repression of religion. <clears throat> so this is House Bill 241124. It's about non-discrimination in places of public access. So if you are a place that provides some sort of public service, um, you open your doors to the public to do X, Y, and Z, then you're subject to non-discrimination laws in the state of Colorado. What this law does is it extends some of the definition of what is non-discrimination and it specifically applies it to nonprofit organizations regardless of religious affiliation. So here's part of the law. Uh, Discrimination in places of public accommodation definition as used in part six of place of public accommodation means any place of business, including a nonprofit's place of business engaged in any sales of the public or any place offering, blah, 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 blah. And then as laws do, you get several lines of descriptions of including, bum, 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 all these businesses that do these kinds of things. Get down to line 17, uh, you're helping the sick, ailing, age, or infirm, a mortuary, undertaking, parlor, or a cemetery, an educational institution. So if you are a part of the state's educational system or you are a private school who might even be a 501c3 nonprofit, you are now, if this passes, subject to these non-discrimination laws in the state of Colorado. Here's what they mean by it. It is a discriminatory practice and unlawful for a person directly or indirectly to refuse withhold form or deny to an individual or a group because of disability, race, creed, color, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, marital status, national origin or ancestry, or viewpoint in all caps. Isn't that interesting? The full and equal enjoyment of the good services, facilities, privileges, advantages, accommodations of a place of public accommodation, or you can't print anything that makes somebody feel excluded. You can't print it. You can't stick it on the walls of your business. You can't mail it if you're a nonprofit organization. Directly or indirectly to publish, circulate, issue, display, post, or mail any written, electronic, or printed communication notice that goes against the non-discrimination policies. So this immediately allows the, um, the woke viewpoint of what is now controlling the state of Colorado into religious organizations. Now, it explicitly excludes churches. An interesting thing about the nonprofit world is that church nonprofits are a different beast than just charitable nonprofits, nonprofit things. So they're two different things. However... I don't believe for a second that if this passes, that churches won't then also be next, right? That we would be subject to the same thing. But think of all of the Christian nonprofits that are here in the city of Colorado Springs that many of us in this church have or do currently work for who have a Christian point of view, a statement of faith. There's certain things that you won't do uh, because of that Christian statement of faith and belief the state of Colorado is going to say, now you can't even mail something that disagrees with viewpoint or gender ideology or gender expression and boom, 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 right? So this particular piece of paper is just about two and a half pages long. There's not a lot of text to it, but it's so intrusive that already national organizations are starting to write about how devastating this would be. Something very similar just passed in the state of Minnesota, by the way, I just literally got passed and signed into law. So these things are all coordinated. 
These laws are pre-written um, and they're making their way through. The last time I checked on the status of this bill, it hadn't yet passed committee to make its way onto the floor, but given the way things work in the state of Colorado, this is going to pass committee. It's gonna make its way onto the floor unless something really drastic happens. It made me think of a couple of individuals. <clears throat> this particular book, um, That Hideous Strength by C.S. Lewis, uh, we reference it every now and then. Um, it's one of the great dystopian novels of the 20th century, and um, people keep talking about it more and more because something that C.S. Lewis wrote 60-some-odd years ago is actually becoming more and more important as we watch what's happening inside of our culture. So there's this group of people um, working for an organization called the National Institute for Coordinated Experiments. NICE, N-I-C-E. It's just a brilliant little acronym that Lewis gave this fictional group. But they're sort of uh, organizing culture around um, scientific and progressive ideals. And it's all very subtle, and it's all very scientific, and it's all very wise. And one of the characters is a guy by the name of Mark Studdock. He's one of the primary characters. He's this young academic who's kind of caught up into this world, doesn't know yet what to do with it. So a lot of the book are, are people inside of this organization trying to describe to him why this is so important. One of these conversations with a great character whose name is Lord Feverstone. I mean, that's just a great name. Lord Feverstone, who's a true believer, says man has got to take charge of man. That means, remember, that some men have got to take charge of the rest, which is another reason for cashing in on it as soon as one can. He's trying to convince this young man to become a part of this. You and I want to be the people who do the taking charge, not the ones who are taken charge of. <clears throat> so in order for us to bring in our utopia, what we really mean is, a few of us powerful individuals are gonna take charge of everybody else and you have got to decide which side of that line you're going to be on now. That is a very, I think, frank description of a lot of what we're watching happen politically and culturally, the remaking of culture and humanity for these kinds of reasons. <clears throat> this book written in 1660, we've referenced it a few times. Samuel Bradford, a pastor and um, a lawyer writes this gigantic book called Lex Rex. Lex is Latin for law. Rex is Latin for king. And the reason the book is called Lex Rex is that he is making the theological and philosophical case that the law is above the king. The king is not above the law, which would mean well, whatever rulers you have, they make the law because they're the lawmakers. What he is saying is, no, as a matter of fact, God is above all rulers. God sets the law so even leaders and kings are subject to God's law. So here's part of what he says in this, this old, old English. If the king be he who makes the law good and just, if, it is the, if it's the king's will and power that makes the law good and right, because he is more such himself than as the law cannot crook and err nor sin, neither can the king sin nor break a law. So the king can never break his own laws because he set his own laws, and if he decides to break it, he can make his own new laws. The king can never sin against the law because the laws are his and he can remake them in any way that he wants to. So it is, it is absolute chaos if the king is allowed to set the laws. He says, this is blasphemy. <clears throat> Biblically speaking, every man is a liar. A law which deserves the name of a law cannot lie. So laws do not originate from human beings. They originate from God. If laws originated from human beings, they would be loaded with our sin and then could not justly be called law. That's tyranny. That's the case that he makes inside of this book. In fact, it is this book that Benjamin Franklin cites to justify the Revolutionary War. Because King George had uh, become a tyrant, instead of ruling through representation um, uh, and, and, and the input of the people of the American colonies, 
he cites the argument of this book and he says, we actually have justification to rise up against tyrants, take up arms and separate ourselves. So this is the power of Samuel Bradford and of a pastor who happened to write a great big book about law. And it was still sticking 116 years after he originally wrote the book. <clears throat> All right, so there's a little bit about what's happening in the state of Colorado and a little bit of you know, how Christians have thought about these things through the years. Um, there was another thing that showed up this last week. And, you know, when we don't do this for a couple of weeks, uh, my list of what in the world is going on that's really crazy just grows and grows, you know. I've got a stack of stuff, you know, uh, virtually speaking, that's a foot deep to go through. So I'm hunting through stuff, and then this week I was just given a gift. So this church called the Common Good Church in Bellevue, Washington, just went viral this last week because last Sunday, one of their pastors, and you can catch this online, various clips of it, or the entire thing is still online, and it is skin crawling to watch. It is difficult to listen to this man say these kinds of things. And then one of their co-pastors at the end, as they're finishing in worship like we do, says some crazy, crazy stuff. I was going to show you a clip of this, but I couldn't find a clip that, you know, some of you have just eaten dinner. <laughs> you know, we didn't bring barf bags. So, uh, <clears throat> A couple of the quotes, literally, the point of his sermon is, what if God worships me? What if God worships us? The text that he uses is from Genesis chapter 16. When Hagar is cast out by Abraham and God shows mercy on her, what she says is this. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me, for she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. So he literally in his sermon says, my, uh, my truth about this story in the Bible, and then he goes on to make his case about, we learn that God loves us so much that he worships us. God worships us. <laughs> Down there below, got a little bit of a quote. What if God worships me? Can you say that with me? So he has the congregation do this call and response thing. What if God worships me? A God who worships me is quite a statement. I know, but follow me. Now I get it. We've started to worship a very big, heteronormative, white Jesus that we constantly thank for standing between us and a mean God. I mean, he just goes straight to every hellfire and brimstone blasphemy, and he does it just without blinking, right? Uh, the co-pastor, as he's finishing in worship, <clears throat> you know, he's kind of praying there. Uh, we declare that you are the God that worships us. That's how much you love us. That's how much you desire us. That's how much you are for us. You are inviting us into a new way of worship where when we step into your presence, we come with our full selves and God is worshiping us. Right? So all this kind of stuff. We're getting past worshiping a white heteronormative Jesus who stands between us and a mean God. He says as well that God finally wins the, and he's mocking the notion of atonement when he says this. God finally wins the battle by sacrificing his son because God, quote, has some fetish with blood. That's how he describes the cross of Jesus Christ. That God wins some sort of weird battle by making his son bleed because God has a fetish with blood. This is a church. They use the name church, right? And throughout the sermon, oh, it just makes God is called she. More often than not, God is called it. He refers to God as it. Won't refer to God as he. Um, and he keeps on speaking about my truth and about worship. So try this the next time you have a friend who wants to call God she. Um, ask them if, if God deserves to be called by his preferred pronouns or not. What are God's preferred pronouns? He and him. <laughs> right? So does he deserve to be called by his preferred pronouns or not, right? So just <clears throat> creepy, creepy, creepy stuff. Um, and his, his disposition is also quite creepy as he preaches. Did God really say 
Who, who spoke those words? The snake, Satan himself. This is the enemy's promise. If you disobey the word of God, you will become like God. He makes a big deal in that sermon of becoming gods ourselves. He literally says we are becoming gods ourselves as God worships us and we come into our full selves in his presence. He is literally repeating the very first lie. Disobey the word of God and you're gonna actually become gods yourself. So this is complete theological chaos. It's blasphemy, um, right? But it is also complete chaos. Who then is God? This is the definition of who is worthy of worship. Worship is a notion of worthiness, worthiness of, of, of our time and effort and energy and sacrifice and honor and glory and time and effort. And what he is saying is, is you're worth as much worship as God is herself, right? Who then is God? Why worship God if she or it worships me? Why would I worship that God if that God worships me? Why shouldn't I worship myself? Right? These are just questions you should ask if somebody says this from behind the pulpit. Just raise your hand, cause a ruckus, and say, why shouldn't I just worship myself, right? Why believe that anything commanded in Scripture is true, good, or binding on my conscience? if you are as worth as much as God is, right? So complete, complete blasphemy. <clears throat> now, in some circles, what has happened at this church is often called the affirming to pagan pipeline. And when a church says these kinds of things, what you discover if you go back a few years is that the church changed their doctrinal statement and they became fully affirming of the LGBTQ lifestyle. And sure enough, about four years ago, um, people have got screenshots of these things in the church's website. They became fully affirming of the LGBTQ lifestyle in 2020. Here we are in 2024. I mean, forget that. That's, that's child's play. Now we're talking about being worshipped by God, right? The, the affirming to pagan pipeline. It just keeps on coming up winter almost every single time. <clears throat> Scripture is pretty serious about this. Meg, I'm sorry, I lost control again there. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. We read these passages and we just read a description of the world that we live in. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Literally teaching what the very first chief demon taught in Genesis. Do the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared love reading Paul sometimes, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created. Can anybody say, eat insects, to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth? Have a steak and thank God for it, right? For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is to be received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. For Timothy 6, 3-5, if anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions. I mean, how many times have we said that a lot of what with the, the battle, a lot of the battleground is fought over the dictionary. What do words mean? What words are we allowed to use? What words can you, can you not use uh, you know, in polite and appropriate company? And Paul says, these deceitful liars are gonna play word games and all of it is designed to cause strife inside of the body of Christ. And constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth Imagining that godliness is a means of gain. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead. And by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth 
and wander off into myths. People are just gonna find these things that they want to hear. They're gonna grab onto it and they're gonna treat it as if it is the truth itself. Paul told us all about this. And the language that he used just continues to describe the way these falsehoods work, right? So I just love reading these things because it continues to highlight to us how to look at these things, how to treat these things, and what's going on inside of, I, I even hesitate to use the word church. The word church has a biblical theological definition. It actually has guardrails to it. And if you are no longer inside of those guardrails, you are no longer the church. Um, you are something else. Um, you are a self-help organization, you are something, but you are not the church of Jesus Christ. So these places label themselves as churches. That's what their YouTube channel says. But biblically speaking, they quit being churches probably a very long time ago. All right, so there's my two cents about what church means. <laughs> but speaking of wild and crazy rulers and wicked and weird things and God working in surprising ways, let's jump back into the book of Esther. We find ourselves in Esther chapter six tonight. And what happens here at this part of the story is the, the teeter-totters. It's been kind of doing this. We've been watching all these things develop. They're kind of surprising. And then it just, wham, it falls over um, as the rest of this passage unfolds here, beginning in Esther chapter six. But let's remind ourselves, getting to this chapter, Esther has begun to hatch her own plot. So Haman's got this plot. He's gotten the king to sign and seal this document that encourages the annihilation of the Jews on this particular day, a year from the signing of this document. Uh, Mordecai and Esther have that conversation about Esther has the opportunity to do something that nobody else does, and Esther steps up to the plate even, if she, even though she knows it could possibly mean her life. And so she begins to hatch her own plan now. So she's calling the king and Haman, who is, as far as the text is concerned, one of the most powerful people in the kingdom besides the king himself. And so she's invited the two of them to a banquet, and they come to the first banquet, and the king is just having a great time. The king is impetuous, um, and he says stuff like this, Esther, whatever you want, all the way to half of my kingdom, ask of it, and I will give it to you. And the reader is thinking, okay, here it comes. She's gonna ask for it. And what she does is she says, come back tomorrow because I'm going to throw another banquet for you in Haman. So that's what has just happened. So now we're at the overnight into tomorrow. And so this is this incredible moment where the king can't sleep. So all night long, he can't sleep. And so he tries to find a way to occupy himself in that night. And things just begin to change. Night falls. It's a most consequential night. And you know, even though God is not named inside of the book of Esther, I think the more we pay attention to the way this book unfolds, especially when we understand it in its Old Testament theological context, it is clear that God is all throughout this book. So God is working even in ways that Esther and Mordecai can't always see. They're doing their part. Um, but they don't have the power to do this or that to the king, but God is still at work even in ways that they can't see. It's invisible in many ways to Esther and Mordecai. <clears throat> they can't guess. Well, if, you know, Esther's thinking, if, okay, the first meal, you know, I'll hop him up on caffeine. He won't be able to sleep. This will probably happen, then this will probably happen. That's not the plan, right? God is the one who's making all of these other things happen. So, that's where we are after banquet number one. We're overnight into day number two of these banquets that Esther's throwing. And that's where we find ourselves in Esther chapter six, verse one. The text says this. On that night, the king could not sleep and he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the chronicles, 
and they were read before the king. And it was found written how Mordecai had told about Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, who guarded the threshold and who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerosh. And the king said, what honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? The king's young men who attended him said, nothing has been done for him. All right, so this, is, again, is surprising. I mean, as this story unfolds, there's just plot twist after plot twist after plot twist. He's just gorged himself on food and wine. He should be sound asleep, right? There's every physical reason for this guy to be gone for several hours, but he can't sleep, right? God is up to something. God is doing something. <clears throat> God is actually, and we're going to see this theme, I think this is going to be important for us to see, that God is at work doing something specific. He's at work defeating the plans of the enemy and remembering his people. This is a lot of God's promise to his people throughout the Old Testament. The laws themselves, even through Deut Deuteronomy, the way the prophets would talk to the people of God, um, that in their faithfulness, um, in God's desire to be faithful to his covenant, they would not disappear as a people, but that God would destroy their enemies and he would remember them. We've talked about that word several times in the Old Testament. Remembering the Old Testament, um, it was all of scripture, but especially in the Old Testament, we get the sense, it's not just, I recall a piece of information to mind, it's I remember to do something. So when it says God is going to remember his people, he says, I'm going to do something for you and about this. When he asks us to remember him, it's the reciprocation. It's the same kind of thing. So God is at work foiling the plan of the enemy and remembering his people and saving them as a nation. So this becomes, I think, part of the theme of the book is that God's sovereign and surprising work often happens in ways that his people just do not know. And this is, I think this is important and I think this is sometimes for us difficult to absorb and to hang on to. And it's often in those moments, and I have to admit my own temptation to be frustrated by these moments as well, those moments when we feel like what we desperately need is the visible hand of God, um, what we're getting is the invisible hand of God. Does that make sense? We don't yet know what God is at work doing, but we are promised that God does not forget his people and God does remember his people and God is at work on behalf of his good will for his people and for his kingdom. And these things are hard um, and it's always at that moment. It's always at the moment of pressure where it's hard to remember this lesson. But we're watching it unfold here in the book of Esther and there's so much. Um, right after the book of Esther comes the book of Job. Maybe we'll get lucky and we'll do the book of Job next. Heather keeps telling me, don't ever do it. I keep thinking, I might do it. <laughs> I have never taught through the book of Job. <laughs> do it. <laughs> yeah. I've done Jeremiah and Isaiah and all these places. But, you know, Job opens up with these incredible scenes but it, when God's counsel with God and with the accuser. And Job has no idea any of that is happening, and yet what's playing out in his life is a result of those conversations. I mean, that's, that's tough. But God has not forgotten his people, and God is remembering Esther and Mordecai and his people. He's working through the courage and the endurance of his people. We talked about that a lot um, in, in Esther chapter 4, and we're watching it unfold now as Esther has stepped up. Um, it reminded me of this passage from Jeremiah chapter 17, uh, verses 7 and 8. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. This tree that has planted itself beside the river of living water, even when there is drought, even when there is difficulty, even when there are reasons to be anxious and afraid, <coughs> Jeremiah says that tree 
can be secure and can continue to live and bear fruit. This is the one whose trust is in the Lord. So <coughs> King Xerxes is having all of his great deeds reread back to him. Heather won't do that for me when I don't sleep at night, but that's a whole other story. I've got a book where I keep my, I don't have a book where I keep all of my great deeds. That would be a very small book, by the way. <laughs> but he's having all these things read to him and he hears of him being saved <coughs> by Mordecai. All those events happened in chapter two. Mordecai was not thanked at the time for saving the king's life. Now, we're reading this in chapter two and you know, part of us thinks, well, that's kind of a slight, why, you know, why wouldn't the king do that? Well, the king didn't do that because God wanted the king to wait until this night to decide to do something about it. So again, God is moving the chess pieces on the board in ways that we don't understand, that they don't understand. Mordecai, we have no inclination that he's asked for anything. In fact, the character of Mordecai comes through even clearer in these, in these two chapters that he's not the kind of guy who would ever ask for that anyway. But the king thinks, I should have done something for Mordecai. Has anything been done? And these guys... These poor guys up at the middle of the night reading this old scroll go, no, nothing, there's nothing here in the scroll about you having done anything for Mordecai. So, these, these moments are just glorious. The sun is starting to peek over the horizon. It's early in the morning. The king hasn't slept all night, but now he's thinking, I need to honor Mordecai. And guess who comes knocking at the front door? So back in chapter six, beginning in verse four. And the king said, who is in the court? <coughs> now, Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's young men told him, Haman is there standing in the court. And the king said, well, let him come in. So Haman came in and the king said to him, what should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? And Haman said to himself, who could the king be talking about besides me? Whom would the king delight to honor more than me? I mean, Haman's just had these gigantic gallows created in his house. You get the image of this bright-eyed and bushy-tailed little schoolboy excited for a hanging that night. Shows up first thing at the king's court, knocking on the door as the sun rises. And he is, the text says, he is ready now to hang Mordecai on these gallows. Before he can get a word in, the king goes, I want you to answer a question for me. <laughs> what should be done to a man that the king decides to honor? So we've hit the peak irony. This, this, this is where kind of that major turning in the book really starts to happen is inside of this conversation. <coughs> And part of what makes these moments here in this conversation so incredible is the depth of Haman's pride. He can only imagine this person to be himself. So Haman continues to be this incredible example of absolute unchecked pride. And scripture is full of these warnings about pride. And scripture connects pride to the original fall of Lucifer himself and those who followed Lucifer. And so then unchecked pride inside of the human heart in scripture is often talked about in terms of partaking in the same condemnation that Satan engaged in. So that's how pride is treated in scripture and, and Haman's kind of right at the center of these biblical examples of pride. Jeremiah 17, great little passage of scripture. Jeremiah 17, nine and 10 the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. And that's just part of what happens in this book is that what is inside of Haman's heart, what Haman wants done to someone else in his pride and hatred is what gets done to him. And God orchestrates it, right? Ezekiel 28, 17, another great passage, is specifically about the fall of Lucifer, but then it's used as an example of pride. 
Ezekiel 28, 17, your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I mean, what a phrase. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you. For the sake of your own pride and glory, you threw away the wisdom that I gave you. I mean, that's, there's, there's a lot to contemplate just in that passage. Then later on in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6, one of the qualifications for an elder inside of the church, he must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit, with pride, and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Fall into the same trap that Satan himself fell into, right? So this is how pride is treated in Scripture, and that's what we're watching unfold with Haman. And um, that's what happens next. The king asks Haman a question, and Haman gives him an honest answer. So verse 7 here in chapter six. And Haman said to the king, for the man whom the king delights to honor, let his royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, not the second guy's robes, but your robe, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. I mean, what does Haman think of himself to essentially ask this of for himself from the king, right? Then the king said to Haman, hurry, take these robes and the horse. He said, you know, that's a good idea, Haman, let's do it. As you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew who sits at the king's gate, remember that detail, who sits at the king's gate, leave out nothing that you have mentioned. So Haman took the robes and the horse and he dressed Mordecai and led him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. This day is not going the way that Haman thought it was going to go, right? He was ready to hang him. Now he's parading him and honoring him in the streets. Pride is blinding. It absolutely blinds Haman um, to literally everything and everyone around him. So because of that kind of pride, another one of the things that pride does is it does not allow us to stand outside of ourselves and take an honest assessment of what's going on around us or in the circles that we are in. Uh, because pride literally blinds us to other people and other circumstances. Do you remember why Mordecai is at the king's gate? He is still in sackcloth and ashes, and he's lamenting over this decree of the genocide of his people. And because he's in sackcloth and ashes, nobody dressed like that can come into the king's court. So a place where he lived and worked for a long time, he can't get into because he is still mourning for his people. So this is where Mordecai is when all of this is taking place. So we've got two very different people here in these two guys. So the king says, hurry and do so to Mordecai, the Jew. Um, this has to be a blow to someone who's so full of himself and full of this kind of hatred for both Mordecai and the Jews to be asked to do this. And at a moment that is this powerfully ironic. I think biblically it is valid to see this as an image of the larger battle that is taking place, so to speak. The plans of our enemy are set and are laid, um, but God is at work, not just foiling the plans of the enemy, but biblically speaking, God is at work also turning the, turning the plans of the enemy back on himself and taking these powerfully ironic moments and turning them for the good of the glory of God and of his kingdom and of his people. The cross is the ultimate plot twist, right? What the enemy thought was going to be done for his good, God rises from the dead and produces the church and life forevermore. So, so right, we see this at work um, in, in this kind of microcosm between Mordecai and Haman, and we get it also in the rest of the biblical story. So 
God in his work, he works in ways that we are, that we see and that we are thankful for. And then we need to understand and remind ourselves that God works in ways that we do not see for a long time. Um, but we are still thankful for, and God is still remembering and at work on behalf of his kingdom, his glory, and his people. Well, let's read uh, the end of chapter six, beginning in verse 12. When Mordecai returned to the king's gate, then, or excuse me, then Mordecai returned to the king's gate. But Haman hurried to his house mourning and with his head covered and Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, if Mordecai before whom you have begun to fall is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. So this is interesting. Every time... Um, one of these characters has gone to their counselors. Haman goes to his wife, Zeresh, and the wise men in his circle. Their advice has always been terrible. I mean, absolutely horrible. But at this moment, this moment is so dramatic that even these guys who give only bad advice give, give a, a clear understanding of the situation here, right? Someone has once said, even a blind squirrel finds an acorn every now and then. <clears throat> you have commanded the genocide of the Jews. And if you are now falling before this Mordecai, a Jew, we don't think this is where it's gonna stop. Um, you're gonna continue to fall before him. And then I, I love the imagery of that little detail. I mean, imagine just for a moment, Mordecai is picked up from the king's gate. He's in sackcloth and ashes. Um, and when that happens, he has probably not cleaned himself for a long time. And he is cleaned up, he is put together, he's given the king's robes, the king's horse, the king's crown, he's given procession through the city. He is honored like nobody but the king is honored before the people in the city of Susa. And Haman, his enemy, is the one who is going before him and proclaiming his honor. And as a result of, of that very heady day, a man who has just been raised to you know, the level of the king's kind of honor, what does he do when the parade is done? He puts his sackcloth and ashes back on and he sits back down at the king's gate. He is still lamenting for his people. So a moment that would yank pride out of most of our hearts just doesn't even touch. Mordecai. Haman, who is desperately seeking this kind of affirmation, goes home and cries. <laughs> he uh, complains to his wife and everybody inside of his household. But the day is not yet done. Verse 14. <clears throat> While they were yet talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. So this has all happened in a day. And so now the banquet's come in the evening, this very special thing that Haman felt very excited to be a part of. And he's invited back to the banquet. But boy, what a day. Chapter seven, verse one. This is all part of the same moment. It's part of the same day, literally. It's good for us to put this together. Chapter seven, verse one. So the king and Haman went in to feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again said to Esther, what is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you, and what is your request? Even a half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, if I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. Then the king Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, who is he and where is he who has dared to do this? Like he had no part in this, right? And Esther said, a foe and enemy, this wicked Haman. 
And Haman was terrified before the king and queen. So we have to remember in this story that Mordecai had encouraged Esther to keep her people quiet, um, to not let it be known that she was a Jewess. So for whatever set of reasons, that was Mordecai's request. Now Haman knew Mordecai was a Jew, but the king did not know that Esther was. And so we read that early on, and we're going, oh, that's okay, that's an interesting detail. But it turns out to become one of the most dramatic details possible when it comes to this moment. She has the attention of the king again. Her enemy is sitting there as well. And the king just, you know, you imagine this flourish of arms and gesticulation. He goes, whatever you want, let me give it to you. And she quotes, essentially, the decree that Haman wrote and that the king signed. And she says, I'm asking for my life and for the life of my people. So here it is. She lays all these cards on the table. If everything goes as planned by Haman, just like Mordecai said, she's not going to be spared because the king has signed this decree and she's a Jew, so she needs to be annihilated. So she lays this on the table. Me and my people have been decreed for annihilation. You go back and you read chapter three and the language that she uses there um, is almost one for one, the language that Haman used to describe what they were gonna get to be able to do to the Jews um, with this decree that he and the king actually signed. So she just kind of lets all out in this, uh, I mean, this is, this, this is kind of the moment, right? To be destroyed, to be killed and be annihilated she, this interesting thing, if it's just that we had been sold as slaves, I wouldn't even bother you with this. That's an interesting statement. That's why they're in Persia, as a matter of fact. The Babylonians had actually taken them as slaves from Judah into Babylon. The Persians inherit the Jews as people amongst them, even as slaves. Um, so that's why they're there in Persia in the first place. So she says, okay, now that's, that's old news, but... Genocide's a different thing altogether, right? So we can't let this happen. The king says, who is he and where is he who has dared to do this? This wicked Haman, right? You know, all of the drama comes to this, comes to a pinnacle here in this moment. Um, thinking about this, um, I thought biblically this is really interesting um, because if, all, if the only context we have for the relationship between Persians and Jews is modern history. All we have is the context of the nation, is of the nation of Iran and the nation of Israel. And that's not a very positive relationship right now. Uh, biblically, it is really interesting how favorable Persian kings are to the Jewish nation. Cyrus is the king the Persian king that signs the decree that allows the Jews to go back home and rebuild their temple and their city and their nation, a Persian king. Darius is the Persian king who loved Daniel. And it's a Darius who supports the building of the temple in the book of um, Ezra. Artaxerxes, the Persian king, is the one who allows Nehemiah to go back and funds his trip to rebuild the city, the walls of Jerusalem. And now Xerxes, with all of his own faults, is actually going to end up helping to save the Jewish nation. So the Persians in antiquity saved the Jews from genocide. Whereas right now, the stated goal of some groups among the Persians is just genocide, right? So it's interesting to see this biblically, I think, especially given our current um, international temperature. So it scares Haman to death. What is the king actually going to do? Everything in this book culminates at this point, right? Mordecai told her not to reveal her people. Mordecai saved the king's life but was seemingly forgotten. Haman hated a man for not bowing to him. Haman managed to manipulate the king's impetuous personality to decree genocide. The king can't sleep. The king loves Esther. And now he knows he wants to kill Esther and her people. So everything hinges on what happens next. 
Is the king going to allow this decree? Because remember, you cannot revoke a law of the Medes and the Persians. The text even told us so. So what is the king going to do? Well, the king decides to sort of step out of the room for a moment, give himself, you know, a little bit of breathing space so that he can start thinking about what to do next. Verse 7. And the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. (coughs) And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the king said, will he even assault the queen in my presence in my own house? As the word left his mouth, left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. So, you know, we would see it as putting a bag over his face. So this, this is the decree. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king said, moreover, well, let me give you a little bit more insight, king. <coughs> moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, is standing at Haman's house 50 cubits high. And the king said, hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. And the wrath of the king abated, right? Incredible moment, um, not just in the book, but even in the history of God's people. Um, The king leaves in this moment. So it just, it perpetuates the drama of the moment. It leaves Haman and Esther together. And you think, well, what what is the king preparing? What is the king processing? (coughs) The king knows that he has signed this decree. The king knows he can't revoke the decree, so something else has to be done to fix what he has done. You know, the reader who's never encountered this book before is wondering, is he going to choose Esther or is he not going to choose Esther? What is the king going to do? Uh, Haman believes it's the end of his life, and so what he does is he puts himself in a position where he looks like he's assaulting the queen. And, of course, that's exactly when the king comes into the room, right? You know, your wife walks in just at that moment. <laughs> it's, you know, it's just what happens, you know? And the king walks in, and there they are. Will he even assault the queen? So whatever is happening, absolutely nothing is going Haman's way <laughs> right now. The king's told about the gallows, so Haman is hung on his own gallows. So God continues to reverse the plot of the enemy and turn his plans against him. And this, again, is something that um, happens in cool ways and is talked about in Scripture in interesting ways. It reminds us of the story of the book of Daniel and uh, Daniel being thrown into the lion's den. The king uh, loved Daniel, but he couldn't revoke his decree, so they have to throw Daniel into the lion's den. Of course, the lions don't eat him. The next morning... Daniel walks out, Daniel chapter 6, verse 24. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions. They, their children, and their wives. And and by the way, something very similar happens to Haman's family. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces, right? So it gets reversed there in in the book of Daniel. It is one of the first lessons of wisdom in the book of Proverbs is that don't hang out with people who plot evil because they will get caught in their own snares. It's the very first conversation that you know, the wise father, so to speak, in the book of Proverbs has with us. In Proverbs 1, 18 and 19, here's part of what is said there. But these men lie in wait for their own blood. They set an ambush for their own lives. They don't know it, but that's what they're doing. Such are the ways of everyone who is greedy for unjust gain. It takes away the life of its possessors. Void people who plot evil because it's going to turn back around on them. And then um, this great little passage out of 2 Thessalonians ran across that, ran across this, looking at this passage of Scripture, and I think it's, it's appropriate. 2 Thessalonians 1, this is evidence of the righteous judgments of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. This is what God is after now. 
But Haman is literally hung in his own gallows. I mean, not that long before this happens. He, he was so excited. He shows up at the king's door ready for a hanging, and he gets one, right? Um, an incredible moment inside of this book. And then this thing that um, I think needs to sit in our hearts and minds, and it's one of these lessons, I think, biblically, that we hear, we hang on to, but you will remember at exactly the moment you need to remember it. And that is that God is always at work on behalf of his people, often in ways that we just don't know. We don't see it, we don't know it. It may be a long time before we see it or know it, but God remembers his people. God is always at work on behalf of his glory, his kingdom, and the good of his people. Even though he's not named, none of us could have organized these two chapters. This is what God is up to, to take care of his children and to glorify his name. So keep that one in your back pocket because it's gonna become important to you at some point in life, I guarantee you. All right, two incredible chapters in the book of Esther. We've only got um, uh, three chapters left in this book and we're gonna end up talking about the saving of the Jews and the Feast of Purim and how all of that unfolds. But as we do so, I will pray and close. Remember, we've got this, um, we'll have information about this petition out in the foyer. Um, please feel free to ask questions about that. We've given you the, the text of that petition. If you want to read that through, um, you know, to make sure that you feel comfortable with what you want to sign. Um, but uh, that will be out there. Make sure you uh, swing by, uh, take a look at that, and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, um, we again are grateful for this time tonight. We're grateful, Father, for your word and how it is a unity that speaks to the glory and the power and the wisdom and the goodness of our God. And Lord, I pray that this is exactly what the word of God does for us this evening, that it encourages us and that it um, sits inside of our hearts as a kind of unshakable truth about who you are and your eye upon your children and your desire for your glory and even the good of your people, however that unfolds in our lives. And Father, we ask for that kind of wisdom and grace this evening. We thank you for this time and may you be glorified because of it. In your wonderful name we pray, amen, amen.